today as we come to the table. My Jesus rules over all things, and he's God Almighty. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord. So what he's saying is, for those who believe in me, as the scripture says, this is the one you've got to believe in. You can't just pick the Jesus you want. You've got to believe in the one, the, script, the way the scriptures lines him out. If you do that, from your heart, from your innermost being, these rivers, living water, will come out. And they'll not only fill you, they'll splash on everyone else. And they're going to say, what's with that guy? What's with that girl? There's something going on in their life that's different. Why? Because rivers of living water are coming out of them. And they're a living testimony for the Lord. He says, that's what will happen if you come to me. When Jesus comes into your heart, you'll know it, and so will the people around you. You'll still fail in the flesh and struggle, but it won't be the same. You'll become a changed person as His love frees you and transforms your sinful nature to be more like His. It's going to push you up river against the current of our culture. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark will continue our study of John, where we'll be reminded that we are set apart in Christ. His message and actions were so countercultural that the religious leaders put him to death. If you're going to follow him, you should expect similar resistance and persecution. Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John chapter 7 as he continues his message entitled, Are You Thirsty? In the original language, it says they were thrown backwards violently flat on the ground. I am. Told you. <laughs> That's the God you serve. They didn't arrest him. He went on his own accord, and it wasn't time for him to go on his own accord, so he didn't let them arrested. arrested. They were arrested by his glory. They were arrested by his power. They were arrested by who he was. This is just a powerful powerful verse, and again, something that should give us great rest and great comfort uh, when we think about just our, how God protects us and watches over us. And look what he was doing, the same thing for the Lord. And many of the people believed in him. And they said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done? In other words, who's going to do more than this? This is the Messiah. I mean, some of them were getting it. They were like, I get this. He has to be the one. Now, there's going to see a whole other crowd saying, no, he's not. You know, they didn't want to believe, and their eyes were closed. The religious leaders certainly didn't want to believe. But the cool thing is, God always has a remnant, even among the Jews. And God will open the eyes of those he wants to open. You know what's really cool? I spoke with a friend of mine who lives in Israel. Um, he's a pastor. He lives over there. And he's hoping to live his whole life there. And he's, it looks like that's working out that way. But he lives in Israel. And I'm talking to him on the phone about 30, 40 minutes this week. And he said, something really cool is happening over here, Mark. I said, what is it? He said, God is moving not only among the Jewish people and getting them saved, he's moving among the rabbis. He said, he said, he said, I can't verify it for sure, but I know it's happening. He said, from those in the know connected to the synagogues, he said, there's somewhere between 80 and 100 rabbis who have now given their life to Jesus in, in Israel. Is that awesome or what? Again, getting ready for the last days. What does the Bible say? In the last days, God will pour out his spirit on Israel and he'll reveal to them that he's their Messiah. And he said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He said, you're going to have to acknowledge me. In other words, once you acknowledge me, I'm coming for you. The nation is going to acknowledge you. God's already moving in the heart of the rabbis. And here's the thing. They're like Nicodemus and, jo and Joseph of Arimathea. They're not revealing it yet. 
They're keeping it quiet for now, but they're working from within. And I don't know how long they're going to be able to hold that in, but they're going, to, they're going to eventually be revealing it. God is working in their hearts. And so he always has his remnant. Some believe, some don't. And in this case, these people are saying, you know what? What are we waiting on? You know, look at the Jews today. What are you waiting on? You had a guy who came who fed all the bill of the Messiah. He raised people from the dead. He gave them sight to the blind. The deaf could hear. He fulfilled over 300 prophecies of him alone. What are you waiting on? What is it that you're watching for? And really, it's nothing because of their own personal motives that they don't yield to the Lord. And these guys are getting it. They're seeing it. Notice verse 32. It says, and then the, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So now, here's the bottom line. Uh, Satan sees that God is having an impact. So he's, he's trying to resist him. They call the police. And they had these, what they call the temple police. They would be like their security duty, if you will. And they were coming to arrest him, go and arrest him. And so Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I shall go to him who sent me. Now, again, the police have already arrived, it would appear at this point. He says, I'm going somewhere, and I'm going to go away, and, and I'm going to go back to the one who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I, and where I am, you cannot come. That is, I'm going to be going back to heaven. Now, they didn't understand he was going to be going back to heaven, but he's telling them, I'm going back to heaven. You can't come. You're going to a different place. I'm going up. You're going down. Two, two different elevators, right? Except for those who believe in me. And so he's telling them, they don't understand. What are you talking about? They're still thinking in the fleshly realm. That is the earthly realm, the earthly mindset. He's speaking spiritually. And notice what he says in verse 35. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Now, again, it sounds like, is he going to the Gentiles? That's not really what they meant here. The word dispersion here is the word diaspora in the language. And that means the Jews that are scattered around the world. Is he going to leave Israel and go to the Jews scattered around the world and go into the filthy Gentile country and those Jews that are not living like good Hebrews and reach them? See, there were two groups of Jews in that day. There were what were called the Hebraic Jews or the Hebrew Jews. That's the ones that were living according to the law, living according to all the rules of, of the Torah, etc., and the Jewish uh, uh, guidelines and religion. And then there were the Hellenistic Jews, Hellenistic coming from the Greeks, uh, Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great conquered the world right before Rome took over, and Rome had taken over by now, by probably stayed, Rome had been in power now probably 50 to 80 to 90 years, somewhere around 80 to 90 years or so at this point. And so, but there, the Greeks had, had, had at one point ruled the whole world, and Alexander had made everyone learn Greek and, and learn the Greek ways. Well, a lot of the Jews did that. And they call them Hellenistic Jews, Greek Jews, so to speak, although they were still Jews. And what they're saying is, is he going to go to those dirty Jews out there, the ones that aren't really walking the way they're supposed to, the Hellenistic Jews, those Greeks out there? Is that who he's going to go to? And of course, the Lord's talking about going back to heaven. And they say in 36, what is this thing? He said, you will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. So they're trying to figure out what it is the Lord is talking about, but they don't understand. And now we finish that day. So this, if you remember, was the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. This is midweek. They had their midweek service. Another midweek service is over. And now we're going to their Sabbath, if you will, the last day, the great day, the eighth day of the feast. Now, let me explain a little bit of what happened on this day before we jump into verse 37. This was called the great day of the feast. Why? This was the culmination. This was the height of everything. This is what they were all working toward uh, to represent their Messiah coming back. Here's what they would do. Every day of the week, they would sacrifice a certain number of animals. They started out with 13, and then they came down to 12, then down to 11, down to 10, all the way down, working their way down. All these other animal sacrifices represented not only them being clean before God, but sacrificing for the other nations of the world. The Jews were saying, God, cleanse them. Have mercy on them, at least symbolically. Now, they didn't really care about them, but it was a part of the Feast of Tabernacles. And God did that so that they would be mindful of other peoples and the nations of the world. The Jews were originally called to reach the entire world, and they failed in that. That's why when God raised up the church, he said, go into all the world and reach them for me. Because the, the Jews failed in that, and now God has called the church to do that. But they would do less and less animal sacrifices till they got, to, as, as I said, to the very last day where they would sacrifice one animal, and that represented the nation of Israel. Now, they would still walk down to the bottom of, of, of the city of David, get the water out of the pool of Siloam, walk the water back up in this big procession, all the people celebrating the three trumpet blasts as they entered the water gate on the lower end. They would go up to the altar, pour the water out, and before they poured the water out, they would circle the altar seven times. They didn't do this, but on the last day, the great day. They would circle it seven times, and it represented the circling of the walls of Jericho, 
remembering when they circled the walls of Jericho, the walls of Jericho collapsed. This was symbolic of the fact if they circled these things seven times, the walls of the world that were resisting God would collapse and the Messiah could return. Or actually for them, come the first time. The Messiah would come the first time. And so this was this basically saying, let the walls of the world that are resisting the Messiah be torn down. Let the Messiah now come. Let him rule. Oh, Father, bring us the Messiah. Show us the Messiah. Rescue us, Lord. We're celebrating as they would march around it. They would do the Hillel Psalms, which were the Psalms of ascent. That is, as they would go up to Jerusalem coming for the feast, they would do Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And so they're making all these proclamations about God, about God's glory, the one sacrifice representing the nation of Israel, the symbolic nature of the fact of the walls of resistance coming down around the world, the Messiah showing up, and then suddenly there'd be this solemn moment where tens of thousands would be gathered on the Temple Mount. They would take the water that last great day. They would pour the water out on the rock, and everyone would just be quiet in prayer before God saying, oh, this is it, Messiah, come, show us the Messiah. Oh, Father, bring the Messiah. And it was quiet. And that's where we take him in 37. Look what happens in that quietness. On the last day, the great day of the feast, while it's quiet, Jesus stood at that moment. They poured the water out. Suddenly he jumps to his feet. He stood and said out loud, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Wow. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine the the disruption? Everyone's saying, get that guy. Where were the temple police? He's disrupting our solemn service. Here we are crying for the Messiah to show up, and he gets up and interrupts the service. He was the Messiah. Your prayers have been answered. I stand in your midst, Jesus would say. And if you'll come to me and drink, I will give you, I will not only satisfy, I will give you eternal life. Can you imagine the shock? I think about it just on a human level. What if it was very quiet? Even if it's not quiet, because if in the service when I'm teaching in here, it's typically not quiet. But even if it was for a moment, and somebody stood up and started just, I have something to say, and I'm we'd all go, we'd all just look and go, okay, what's going on? This is interesting, right? And, you know, so, okay, that kind of thing. This happened. The moment he stood up and began to shout, everybody just stopped. And you see the crowd, tens of thousands, turning and looking at this one guy, shouting out. And listen, the sound travels wonderfully over there. They all heard him very easily. Trust me. It's an amazing acoustic that God has created in the Middle East. It shocks me every time I go. But he's crying out. They hear him crying out, and they're all looking at him. Some of the, the, the religious, religious leaders are probably thinking, where are the temple police? Arrest this man. What's going on? And the Lord is basically saying, I am that water. I'm the rock that went with you in the wilderness. I gave you the water in the wilderness, and now I'll give you eternal water, spiritual water for all your, for, for not only this life, but for eternity, if you'll just turn to me and come to me. And so this, again, was an amazing, amazing moment, a shocking moment, an exciting moment. Everybody wondering what in the world they're supposed to do, this solemn moment as he's declaring he is that rock, he is that water. And notice what it says here. A couple things to note about this. It's interesting. He said, anyone who believes in me as the scripture has said. Now, I want to make a couple of points about that. Number one, the scripture does say that if we believe in God, that out of us will flow this river of life, if you will. It speaks about the inner man, water coming from the inner man and, and just coming from our very being and just coming out of us. You know, it'd be like you sharing from your mouth and you're sharing the gospel and you're just, it's coming from your mouth as you're sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. You can't hold it back. It's a, it's a torrent. It's a river, a raging river, so to speak. That's what it means. So the Bible says that will happen for those who, who come to God. But there's another meaning here in this. There's another application that is also true, and that is this. For those who believe in Jesus, note this, as the Scripture has said, out of them rivers will flow li- ri- rivers of water, not livers. Livers will not... If they do, go to seek, seek medical attention immediately. You should that happen. <laughs> Rivers of living water will flow. Because here's what happens, guys. We have to believe in Jesus as the scripture has said to have this flow of river, rivers of water. It's got to be Jesus. Now, what do you mean by that? As the scripture has said. Listen, a lot of people, everybody's got a Jesus. Have you noticed? Ask the Mormons. They've got a Jesus. They think he's Satan's brother. That's not my Jesus. Ask the Jehovah's Witness. They say that Jesus is Michael the archangel. How do you confuse that one? I don't know. And I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying it's amazing when you step into deception, how deceived you can be. Ask, ask a Muslim who Jesus is. He's not the son of God. And he's, and he's a prophet only, and he's lesser 
than Muhammad. That's not my Jesus. My Jesus rules over all things, and he's God Almighty. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord. So what he's saying is, for those who believe in me, as the scripture says, this is the one you've got to believe in. You can't just pick the Jesus you want. You've got to believe in the one the, script, the way the scriptures lines him out. If you do that, from your heart, from your innermost being, these rivers, living water, will come out. And they'll not only fill you, they'll splash on everyone else. And they're going to say, what's with that guy? What's with that girl? There's something going on in their life that's different. Why? Because rivers of living water are coming out of them. And they're a living testimony for the Lord. He says, that's what will happen if you come to me. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Remember, no one could have the inhabiting of the Holy Spirit. That is, he couldn't live inside of anyone until he died on the cross. Three works of the Spirit. You'll find three different words in the Scripture describing the work of the Spirit. He is with us. It's the word para, P-A-R-A. He is in us, I, uh, E-N. It's the same thing as our word, I-N inside of us, and he is upon us, EPI, that's where the power comes. They all have a very specific work. The EPI, the coming upon, that always happens when God wants to give you power, power to live the Christian life, power to be a witness, power to do what God has called you to do. So if you need power, go to God and say, God, come upon me with your Holy Spirit. Give me power. If you want God to be with you, you say, God, I need you to be with me. Be along beside me, which he will be anyway, but be with me in this. If you want God to live inside of you, there's the only way that can happen. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. He comes inside to live and you're born again. This hadn't happened yet. Until he died on the cross, he did not live inside anyone. Uh, he only came upon and was with them. So the, John makes the comment of that. He had not yet been glorified. This couldn't happen yet. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this, said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Some said, will the Christ come from Galilee? Now, again, notice prophet in Christ. Again, remember, in Deuteronomy, it talked about a promised prophet. Well, they thought they were two different people. They thought the prophet was one person and the Christ was another. Actually, they're the same. The prophet, he was speaking of the Christ. And when he spoke of the prophet there prophetically, and of course, Jesus is the Christ. So one and the same, but they didn't understand that at this time. And they're saying, is the Christ going to come out of Galilee? They didn't know where the Christ was going to come from. They, as again, as we said, they thought he was just simply going to appear. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? Isn't it amazing? Jesus was right in their midst and they didn't even know who he was. He was born in Bethlehem and he was of the seed of David. And I'll bet you anything, the rabbis knew that. The rabbis may not have known he was born in Bethlehem, but they knew he was the seed of David. You know why? They kept all of the genealogical records of every one of the families of Israel in the temple at that time. That's where they stored all their genealogical records, which means all they had to do, and I guarantee you they did it because they wanted to discredit him. All they had to do was look up the genealogical line of Jesus and his family and follow it back, and they would find that Jesus was in a direct line with David the king. And so I guarantee you when they found that out, they didn't say a word. They remained quiet. But if they could have found that he linked to anyone else, they would have been broadcasting it all over every newspaper that they could in that town because they would have said, he's not the Messiah. He can't be the Messiah. He doesn't link back to David. By the way, the Jews have a very unique problem today in proving who their Messiah is. You know why? They have to be able to prove genealogically that he goes back to David. Guess what they can't prove anymore? The genealogical records were destroyed in 70 AD when Rome came in and burned down the temple as they were destroying Jerusalem. Every one of the genealogical records of the Jews was destroyed at that time. That means that no one today can prove genealogically that they go back to David. They can prove genealogically they're a Jew because we now can do that through DNA, but they can't prove they go back through the line of David. That means unless there was someone born before 70 AD who claimed to be the Messiah and could prove it, no one can ever take that stand. I've got a candidate for you. This is why Jesus is the obvious choice, not only for us, but for them. And so he's not even of David. Yes, he was. He wasn't of Bethlehem. Yes, he was. It says, so there was a division among them or among the people because of him. And by the way, whenever you introduce Jesus into any situation, there will always be a division among the people. There may be a division among some of you this morning. There may be some of you visiting that don't agree that other religions can't get there. What do you, he said other religions can't get there, only through Jesus. It's causing a division right now. This is good. Let me tell you why it's good. Because unless Jesus comes and brings division in your heart and challenges you on what you believe, you can't be saved. You'll never be challenged on it. You've got to realize, wait a minute, you mean everybody's not okay? 
Everybody's not going to heaven. All religions don't go to heaven. What's going on here? I've got a problem. Division, it's a good thing. We don't like it. We don't like the tension. We don't like the way it feels when we're in the middle of it or worse yet when we're causing it, right? But it's a wonderful thing because it's what brings people to the conviction that they need God and they need him to save them. And so there was a division among them and there's gonna be a division among you guys if I don't finish really fast because I'm long and I didn't realize that. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came and the chief priests and Pharisees and said to him, why have you, why have you not brought him? And the officers said, no man ever spoke like this. Can you imagine? You send the police to get him. The police show up. They come back and the, the, the Sarge, you know, where is he, guys? I sent, you, I sent the officers over to get him. Sarge, you never heard a guy. You never heard a guy talking like this. What? You didn't arrest him because he could talk good? What are you talking about? The police just didn't get him. This is the authority and the power that he walked in. And the Pharisees answered, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? And secretly, yes, Nicodemus had, probably even Joseph by this time, but Arimathea. He says, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. It's so, so much pride. They don't even know what the Bible says. We're going to see in a minute, these guys don't know what the Bible says. Nicodemus, and he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? This is just logical. We're supposed to hear what he's saying. Let's go and see what he's saying. They didn't care what the law said. They had their own agenda. Forget the law. We want what we want. The law doesn't matter. And by the way, when people are so bent on what they want, the law is thrown out the window. Forget the law. We want what we want. Who cares what the law says? Tell that Nicodemus got to shut up. And they answered and said to him, are you from Galilee? They now began to assail him. Search and look for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Really, no prophet has arisen out of Galilee um, except for Jonah, Nahum, Elijah, to name a few. These guys who thought they knew so much were ignorant in the very thing they thought they were experts in. And they're simply attacking because they hated Jesus. And it says, and everyone went to his own house. Guys, here's the bottom line. Are you thirsty today? Are you thirsty? Believer, you can get thirsty. It gets dry sometimes as a believer, doesn't it? We walk the journey. We, we, we share our faith. We, we use up the fullness of the spirit. That's why the Bible says we're to go to God every day. Ephesians 5.18, be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit is what it says in that passage, in, in the language. Be continually filled. That's for the believer. If you're dry today, ask God to fill you. Come to Jesus. Get filled fresh. And for those of you that don't know the Lord, if there's anybody that doesn't know the Lord, listen, you're never going to be satisfied by everything you're running to. Your, 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 your video games, your sports, women, men, things. You're always going to be a temporary, woo, and then you're done. And now you're looking for the next, woo, and then you're done. The girls got me for, you know, just, you know, it's Father's Day and all this. They got me this pie. I love these pies. They know I love them. I ate two pieces immediately when I got the box yesterday. And you know what I'm thinking about right now? That pie. <laughs> I'm teaching you, and I'm thinking about Pie. Have mercy on me, Lord. But you know why? Because it only satisfies for the moment. And until that next luscious <laughs> bite of pie goes in my mouth, I'm not satisfied. Jesus is different. When you receive him, you'll be satisfied in your inner soul. Yes, you still have cravings. Yes, you still have needs. Yes, you're sometimes going to feel empty in things. But there's a satisfaction in your soul that goes, I'm rested in God. I know where I'm going when I die. I know that everything's going to be okay. It's a satisfaction. You have drunk from the wells of life, and no one can ever take that from you. Isn't that wonderful? And I invite you this morning, if you haven't drunk from the wells of life, run to Jesus this morning and drink. It's free, and it's eternal. While we're wrapping up our time at the table of God's Word for today, your time in the Bible doesn't have to. In fact, we'd like to encourage you to keep reading. There's so much to learn about Jesus and His love for you and for the world. If you missed any part of this broadcast, or if you want to hear it again, you can by visiting PastorMarkKirk.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, too. That way you'll never miss an episode. You can also join us on Facebook to get the latest information on that day's broadcast, along with some inspiration and encouragement for your news feed. There's a link for that, too, at PastorMarkKirk.com. Now, before we close, let's hand it back over to Pastor Mark one more time. I'm glad you took the time to join me today to study the Gospel of John. It's such an incredible testimony of Jesus' ministry here on earth. 
I hope you've been blessed, and I know I've been blessed teaching it. I'd like to ask you a favor as well. Would you commit to praying during this study through John? Please pray that the Holy Spirit would lead people to this program so that they can find hope in Jesus. And pray that they'd have open ears and soft hearts. I know the message of Jesus can transform lives and heal brokenness, but not if they never hear it. Thanks for lifting your fellow listeners up to the Lord. And thanks for joining me today and every day that we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.